The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Rob Ford did it more than a decade ago. Doug Ford, too, in 2018. And now the new federal conservative leader won the top job with it, a populist pitch to the working class. Tonight, is conservatism becoming the voice of Canada's working people? Then, Nam Kiwanuka talks to Washington Post columnist and author Christine Emba about her provocative new book, Rethinking Sex. It's Monday, September 19th, and that's tonight on The Agenda. Traditionally, it has been the political parties on the left which planted their flags as representatives of working people and the working class. But from Doug Ford's new rapport with private sector labor unions to the new federal Conservative Party leader's posture as a defender of the working class, the right is making its case for that support. With us now to consider the shift on Manhattan Island in New York City, Sean Spear, editor-at-large of The Hub, senior fellow at U of T's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. In our nation's capital, Armin Yalnesian, economist and Atkinson Fellow on the Future of Workers. And John Ibbotson, writer at large for the Globe and Mail. And we're delighted to welcome you three back to our airwaves tonight here on TVO. And we're just going to set up our discussion by playing a little snippet of Premier Doug Ford's victory speech back in June. Sheldon, roll it if you would. Together, we're reimagining our party, we're reimagining our province, and tonight, we have changed what it means to be a progressive conservative in Ontario. It's no, my friends, it's no, it's no longer about being part of the blue, the red, the orange, or green team. It's about recognizing that there's so much that unites us. This is my proudest achievement as a leader of this party, building a new coalition, expanding our base, creating a more inclusive party where everyone matters. Because never in our lifetime has it been more important for a party to represent all of Ontario. Now, now more than ever, we need unity. Sean, I want to pick up on that line. We have changed what it means to be a progressive conservative in Ontario. And the Premier's contention that he's created a new coalition, which obviously includes private sector labour unions as part of it. Do you see that as a grand new coalition in Ontario politics these days? I, I think the short answer is yes, Steve. Um, in a way, Canada is um, slow in this broader trend occurring across um, Western societies, what's sometimes referred to as a re realignment of our politics. Viewers will be familiar with Donald Trump's um, un unorthodox voter coalition or um, the British Conservatives' breaching of the so-called Red Wall in, nor in the nor Northern England in the, in the 2019 election campaign. It reflects a kind of a, a sorting of our politics in which education is increasingly a major proxy for whether you vote for the left or you vote for the right. Um, and I think what the Ford has done, frankly, better than any conservative in the country, is start to recognize this trend and reorient um, the party's messages and policy agenda to reflect um, this new accessible voter voting group, um, uh, which comprises um, working class um, Canadians. Armin, I'll put a different quote to you. This one from an NDP insider who said about the last provincial election, we gave up the working class to get the chattering class, and we do great with the chattering class, so said this NDP insider. Uh, if that's accurate, do you agree that was a bad trade? If it's accurate, it was a bad trade. But is it accurate? So I think there's a lot going on here. I agree with Sean that Canada is late to the party, but within Canada, the Conservatives have been the most adept at understanding that population aging means the smallest working age cohort we have seen in half a century, and their vote is very valuable, and it's time to go after them. 
And so they wrap themselves in the flag of the working class, but in fact do not represent the working class or present a path. Their policies, their messages are on, but their policies are not on to the path that is required to move uh, towards the economy of the future, which is going to value workers more and more. And that's actually the fight for all parties to take part in. The Conservatives just got out the gate fastest. <laughs> okay, John, uh, in your view, has the NDP given up on the working class? in order to get the chattering class? Well, yes and no. I'm not sure about the premise of this question. If, if you look at the coalition that Mike Harris put together in the 1990s, and you look at the coalition that Doug Ford has put together now, I'm not sure it's all that different. Um, traditionally, the Liberals and the NDP own the city centres, whether it's Toronto or Ottawa or London. Um, the Conservatives own the rural areas, and then they fight over the suburban ridings in between the two, especially the suburban ridings of the 905, the, the ridings that are outside Toronto. And in the mid-1990s, Mike Harris put together a coalition of rural and suburban voters, immigrant voters, working class voters, middle class voters, that I think resembles a lot the coalition that Doug Ford put together uh, as well. That said, um, it is clear throughout the Western world that there is a move afoot by conservatives to grab the loyalties of working class voters. And and to some extent, it's succeeding. I'm not sure yet how much it's succeeding in Canada and whether it's succeeding at the federal level rather than the provincial level, but it's out there. And of course, it is based not on economic values. You know, it's the what's the matter with Kansas argument. Why do working class voters not vote for policies that one uh, believes would advantage the working class? It might be because there are other things other than economic self-interest. If you are a party that is dedicated, for example, to um, fighting global warming, to combating racism, to combating other forms of isms, uh, to, to gender equality, you might find that you're alienating the guy on the line. You might find that you're alienating um, the secretary, the, the, the pink collar worker as well. Those people might find that whatever their economic interests might indicate, they are not valued by progressive parties. In fact, they are accused of privilege by progressive parties. And if you are not valued, if you are looked down on, if you are told that you are to blame, you will not, generally speaking, accept blame. You will instead vote for a different party. Armin, you want to take that on? Well, it's hard to see Doug Ford's campaign as embracing any of the things John just talked about. 22% of the workforce works in the care economy. Bill 124 it puts a, a ceiling on how much publicly funded care economy workers can earn of 1%. In the middle of inflation, we're not even allowed to talk about how we're going to deal with inflation. This government sided with Uber to create a new tier of labor rights that are neither fish nor fowl, neither independent contractors nor fully employees, when our superior court said in conjunction with every other superior court in Europe and in the United States, that Uber workers are their employees. So in what sense is this a government that is wrapping their arms around improving uh, workers' rights? I, I, I don't see it. I, I think everything John has said is absolutely correct. But workers aren't going to buy uh, what they're being sold, by and large, I don't think. It does come down to dollars and cents. And this is a government that rolled back minimum wage, has not provided 10 paid sick days. After two and a half years of pandemic, it's like, where are the goods here? They love to wrap themselves around blue collar workers and a handful of unions that represent less than a fifth of organized workers in this province. They do not wrap their arms around the real hard workers of this province. Okay, Sean, have at it. If I could just respond, I'd make two quick points. I think John is, is indeed right um, that the entry point for a lot of these um, voters moving from the left to the right is culture and a, a sense that progressive parties have uh, a, adopted a, a kind of set of propositions about um, race and, and gender and identity and so on um, that, find, that they find um, a bit alien um, to their day-to-day -day lives. Um, um, but I agree with Armin. Um, if if culture is the entry point, at the end of the day, um, it's up to conservatives to build a policy agenda that speaks to the economic interests and, and needs of these voters. And I think that remains an open question. I, I think, for instance, Steve, 
of a prescient book back in 2008 by Ross Douthat and Rehan Salam in the United States called Grand New Party. And it, it, in effect, observed these trends occurring within the American polity and called on Republicans to uh, uh, modernize the party's agenda to better reflect this growing share of its voter coalition. Um, Republican politicians ignored that advice. And the short story is we got Donald Trump. And so it's one thing to bring these voters into the coalition. Um, the, set, the big question for the Ford government and for conservatives across the country, are they prepared to, in effect, adjust uh, and rebalance uh, the policy agenda to, to, to reflect these voters? And I will just make one final point. Um, this was a, a major tension or fault line within the federal conservative party during Aaron O'Toole's leadership. He sought to make um, policy overtures to these types of voters and face some pushback, particularly in the caucus, because there was a generation of conservatives that had grown up, you know, steeped in the free market um, economic orthodoxy of the, the Reagan and Thatcher era. So um, I, I think this trend is happening. Uh, the Ford government is cap with Ford led conservatives have capitalized it. Um, the big question about its durability will, will be if, if and how um, the, the party's policy agenda uh, adjusts accordingly. Well, John, I would be interested in your take on the, I think, unprecedented development that happened in the last provincial election, namely eight private sector unions endorsing Doug Ford and the progressive conservatives. Armin is right about the percentage of what that represents in the grander scheme of things. But the fact is it was eight unions. Do you see that as an historic shift or is this a temporary alliance? <laughs> It's a temporary alliance that might become a historic shift. <laughs> uh, the first thing we have to do, though, is distinguish between public sector and private sector unions. Again, this was a case when I was covering Queen's Park uh, back in the 1990s before the mountains were formed. You had a lot of blue-collar private sector unions supporting Mike Harris. Those big mm -hmm. days of actions, remember this is the, the grand strikes that were shut, uh, shutting down entire cities, were driven largely by public sector unions. Um, people working in the provincial public service, uh, people in education, uh, and yes, people in healthcare as well. But the steel workers were never on side. The auto workers were never on side. And I think what you're seeing is not simply a shift um, to be of, of working class voters or lower middle class voters towards conservatives. You're seeing as well a schism uh, between public sector workers and private sector workers, whether they are unionized or not unionized with the private sector workers more likely now to move towards conservative parties where taxes are low and regulations are few and are, and you get to be the freest country in the world if you believe Pierre Polyev, and public sector unions that are looking more uh, for greater assistance uh, by the state uh, for their jobs, which are jobs that are within the state. Now, Armin, I saw your eyebrows go up there, so I'm, <laughs> I'm inferring from that that you're not quite sold. Go ahead. Um. I agree with John that there is a schism between the private and public, both for conservatives in particular. But just generally, we're seeing two, two major narrative flips, which account a little bit for what we're seeing with the conservative agenda. The first is that after 40 years of labor surpluses, population aging, that's my age group and John's age group, um, at some point, we're going to exit the labor market completely. And we have fewer entrants to the labor market than exits from. And that tightness in labor markets isn't going away for the next decade or two. And we haven't seen that in half a century. We haven't seen that actually since the early 50s, this type of tightness in the labor market. And that changes politics. It does change bargaining power. And one of the things that is happening in public and private sector unions that John rightly pointed out was the case with Mike Harris is we now have the first female president of one of the largest private sector unions, Lana Payne. And Unifor represents a lot of personal care workers in the healthcare sector. The line between public and private is blurring. Uh, when it comes to the care economy. And with an aging population, you're going to also have to flip the script on more market, less government, which is what I've lived with my entire life as an economist. Without more government, government funded public services, we are going to see more people living a declining quality of life, notwithstanding the fact that we are still the ninth largest economy in the world because of our insistence that governments don't get too large. And that's a, 
That's a conservative shibboleth I don't know will be overcome by population aging. But that will be a second big fight within the conservative movement is, will you expand government to support people who are too young, too old, and too sick to work? Will you actually help service their needs as they are no longer productive members of society doing the job? Hmm. Sean, maybe I could get you to sort of pilot this ship up to 30,000 feet and give us the big broad view here. Uh, namely, um, well, let's, let's put it this way. You just co-authored a study on the nature of the changes that the working class has seen in the last many years. Maybe you could just hit us with some of the bullet points on that. Yeah, th thanks, Steve. Um, you know, there's a tendency in conservative circles, even the ones that I think are predisposed to leaning into this sort of realignment, I think to take a, a slightly outdated view about what represents uh, the modern working class. You know, you hear, for instance, slogans like, uh, we're for the people who shower after work, not just the people mm. who shower before work. It, it's a good line, but it doesn't uh, increasingly doesn't reflect uh, the experiences of the modern working class. Let me just give you some quick hits. There's about six and a half million workers in jobs that would be constituted as working class. That represents about 34% or so of the workforce. Um, more than half are, are of those workers are women. About half are in sales and services, not so-called blue-collar work that one usually that thinks about when when he or she talks about the so-called working class. Um, they're disproportionately represented in cities. Um, I could go on and on. I guess the the, the major takeaway here. Uh, Steve, is that the complexion of the working class is changing. And if conservative parties at the provincial level and at the national level are, are, are genuinely committed to a working class agenda, it has to be rooted in the working class as it is, not as not the working class as um, as it used to be. And and that means that the, the, the policy uh, responses are, are going to have to change as, as well. It's not merely about supporting manufacturing or resource development. It's going to have to address issues like housing or transit or modern labor standards, or as Armin says, thinking about the, the role of public services. I guess it's a long way of saying, uh, I think the Ford government um, ought to be lauded for this insight that it had about the potential uh, with working class voters. Um, but the key will be following through that to, to develop a policy agenda that truly meets working class voters where they are. And Armin, if this working class is becoming increasingly female, in number and percentage. Can you talk to us about the political implications of that down the road? I think one of the biggest stories that the entire global north is facing, because, you know, China is already talking about not having enough workers. China, because of its one-child policy in the 1980s. If China's worried about not having enough workers, then we should be sweating bullets. But we're not preparing for any of the things that re require a very different approach to work when we have things we have to do that are both paid and unpaid. Women traditionally do that. Women are now half the payroll and have been for a number of years now. And we have seen no increase in paid leaves in this province, uh, not only during a pandemic where you would think that you want to contain the contagion by letting people stay at home, whether that's in retail or restaurants or whatever it is. Zero crickets on that. Um, in fact, this government rolled back uh, from uh, rolled back the number of paid sick days that the previous administration had brought in. So I think this whole issue of time is also going to be a major thing as women are asked to do more paid work because we need all hands on deck. It's the smallest working age cohort in half a century. But none of the unpaid things go away. So how are we going to deal with some of those issues, too? And also, how are we going to permit people who are misclassified as um, independent contractors, the people that are doing on-demand home care, the people that are doing all sorts of things in sectors that you wouldn't normally think of uh, that are being classified as not employees? Do they have any labor rights? That's what we are hmm really worried about as we move forward. And John, maybe I could get you to, in your judgment, characterize the relationship as you see it between those whom we had a great deal of praise for at the beginning of the pandemic, the people who stocked our shelves in supermarkets and went to school to try to teach kids online, and nurses, of course, who were risking their lives to work in hospitals, 
with, um, well, compare them to the so-called laptop class, who could sort of work from home quite easily, uh, as I suspect the four of us were able to do during the course of the pandemic. Go ahead. How do you see it? Yeah, it is very much a, a question of, as you say, the, the workers versus the laptop class. It's also very much a question of immigrants versus native born. When Justin Trudeau became prime minister, Canada was bringing in 250,000 immigrants a year, the highest rate of intake uh, just about of any country in the world, uh, of any developed country in the world on a per capita basis. We're now taking in about 450,000 people a year because our beat is right. Our birth rate will not sustain our population. It's well below the replacement rate, and it continues to fall, like all developed countries. All population growth, all growth in the workforce is now dependent upon bringing in immigrants. And we used to think that the immigrants we brought in uh, would be doctors and lawyers and engineers and software programmers and, types like, and people like that. But what the pandemic revealed is the real labor shortages, as Armin says, are among personal support workers in long-term care homes, in home care, in, in construction, in drywalling, in transportation. The future immigration streams may very well be the very working class we're talking about. They may very well be people from South Asia. A third of our immigrants now come from India. Um, and uh, other parts of the developing world who are filling in all of those gaps that are emerging. If they are the new working class, then what we should really should be asking ourselves is, what are their values? What are their politics? What do they want? What do the new Canadians coming in to fill all these jobs want? And what can a politician, conservative or progressive, do to win them over? All right, you've asked the questions. What are the answers you come up with? <laughs> I think you look for things like labor mobility, you uh, a pension mobility, uh, the rights of workers to move from one job to another. You're going to see an increase in wages for um, for, for sort of lower income people, whether it's through uh, mandatory minimum wages or whether it's just the pressures of the market. I think you will find, and I hope this is true, that people who are what used to be considered low wage, low skilled jobs are in fact going to be able to command a greater degree of political influence and labor influence as the labor shortages increase because the labor shortages are only going to increase forever as our fertility rate drops below 1.4 where it is now heading towards one where it is in many countries in the world our population will be always at risk of absolute decline without those workers who are brought in to fill those jobs those workers are going to have some clout a kind of clout they might not have had since the early decades of the last century sean you look like you want in on that yeah, let me just make two political observations, if I if I may. The first is, you know, viewers will know that the Canadian Conservative Party at the national level and provincial Conservative parties in most of the country have been stuck in what I describe as a, a high floor and low ceiling, which is to say um, they have amongst the highest base of support of any of the major parties, but struggle to, to build on that base of support. And so I think, you know, at a kind of crass political level, the judgment being made by Mr. Ford and, and conservatives elsewhere is that these voters represent a means to, in effect, raise that ceiling um, and, and be able to compete north of 35, 36 percent of, of the vote. And that'll be crucial if conservative parties are going to compete uh, on a consistent basis in elections across the country. The second political point I, I'd make, though, is we're, we're talking a lot about the opportunities and challenges for conservatives with respect to working class voters. I wouldn't want to let progressive parties off the hook. Um, the fact is, as the, the, the quote you, you cited at the beginning of our conversation to Armin represented, I think there's an increasing sense amongst progressives um, that a combination of left-wing economics and, um, you know, for lack of a better term, identity politics, woke politics, whatever one wants to describe it, um, it reflects the interest and preferences of, um, as John calls it, the laptop class, but is increasingly alienating these voters that for a long time have been core um, to the, the political support of of progressive parties. It ought to be a, a kind of reckoning, it seems to me, um, for progressive parties. And yet, there's not a lot of evidence that that they're that they are grappling with these questions, that, that they continue to advance um, much of the same messages and policy agenda that have, are turning these voters off in the first place. And John, just a quick follow on that. Do you see Pierre Poilievre's victory as the new leader of the Conservative Party and His Majesty's uh, loyal opposition leader as deepening the trends that we're talking about tonight? 
Well, we're certainly going to see this experiment because he is not Aaron O'Toole. He is not Andrew Scheer. He is pursuing an identity-based uh, conservative agenda that, for example, attacks universities by saying that they must uh, incorporate free speech uh, policies in exchange for government grants by threatening to defund the CBC. So he is attacking all of those elite laptop class shibboleths in what he believes is an agenda that will resonate with lower uh, class, working class, non-university educated um, Canadians. Will he succeed with that? Will he actually expand the conservative base, uh, as Sean says, beyond one third and bringing it up closer to 40 percent? Or will uh, he alienate and anger those voters uh, because, at the end of the day, his economic policies do not advantage them? He's culturally playing to their insecurities, but he is not playing economically to their insecurities. Will that work? We're going to find out. Indeed. As all these discussions inevitably end, Time will tell is the line that we use. But we're not at the end yet. I still got more questions for you guys. Armin, I wonder if you could tell me how concerned you are that the phenomenon that we're talking about here tonight could lead to a significant reshifting in priorities in politics and, and therefore a significant chunk of the working class will start to identify themselves more with the conservative end of the spectrum as opposed to the more progressive end of the spectrum. I think it depends if uh, John is correct that uh, the working class shifts towards some kind of cultural something. I don't know what it is. I mean, Poilievre represents a kind of trump light American agenda with his insistence that we need to be more free, whatever that means. Free from, free to what? I don't know what he's, I don't know what he's selling. He's selling, I'm not Trudeau. So cool. That's a wedge. That's a form of wedge politics. But um, if Trudeau goes back to, um, the the surf that he wrote in 2015, which is grow the middle class and the people trying to get into it, that is the working class agenda. That is wh where you want to make every job a good job. You want to build resilience in the labor market from the bottom up. You want to improve wages and working conditions, and you want to improve the public services everybody can rely on so that Good public services are not a function of how much you have in your pocketbook or who you work for. So I think there is something going on here. But uh, just to cut to the chase, the, we are not ready for the shift in bargaining power, which is radical. What is about to happen over the next 20 years is a radical shift in bar bargaining power because we are going to need workers from high skill to low skill, from high pay to low pay, and we are not valuing them right now. We are doing the opposite. I just want to add one detail that I want to chime in uh, after John spoke about the 450,000 immigrants. We fancy ourselves a nation of immigrants. We have turned into a public policy debacle like in the United States and in some European countries, of uh, being more and more reliant on temporary foreign workers than migrant workers over time. And it is accelerating, it is not decelerating. So last year, 2021, a year of pandemic, we brought in a, approximately 1.2 million newcomers, not 400,000 400, immigrants, 1.2 million newcomers who were permitted, two, two out of every three were permitted to come in temporarily to study and to work. This is a new world. And if you want to talk about valuing workers, how we do this thing about how we value the workers that are high paid, low paid, and everything in between, will depend on what our immigration policy looks like. And just to be totally clear, the entire global north is going through this at the same time. Hmm. And the people from the global south that are coming here will have their choice of wherever they, they feel is the best people magnet. So we better be one of the best people magnets if we are not going to see not only our population decline, but our economy decline. The only thing I would add to that, Steve, if I may, sure. is that this political realignment is occurring against the backdrop of a, a larger intellectual or ideational uh, uh, rebalancing. Um, you know, the uh, from the financial crisis to the pandemic, I think the so-called Washington consensus, which is guided 
policymaking, you know, across the political spectrum for the better part of 30 or 40 years is under significant strain. And it's kind of jumbling, um, you know, the, the, the left-right spectrum. Um, Ar Armin and I disagree on a, a number of issues. Um, um, but the truth is the work that she's done on um, the rising care economy, the work that she's done raising concerns about temporary foreign workers competing away the, the economic um, comp competitiveness of working class Canadians. Um, this is something that I think increasingly will find a, a herring, an airing and a home within conservative politics. And so, you know, as I say, I think we're, we're living in a kind of fascinating time. And, and I'll just wrap <laughs> up with one point. Um, you know, you mentioned Polyev and his resonance with these voters. One statistic worth mentioning is more than half of people currently in working class jobs have educational credentials that exceed the, the, the basic market expectation for those occupations. And that is a voter group that Polyev spoke to throughout the leadership campaign. These are people who did everything they were supposed to do, as he puts it, and are stuck um, in jobs that are that are not leveraging their human capital. And oftentimes they find themselves, as he often said during the campaign, living with their parents or or in small uh, apartments because the housing market has similarly closed them out. So I, I, one wonders if that's a, a sub-segment of the working class um, for which um, um, Polyev may be uh, able to make gains. Right. Thanks so much, you three. That was terrific. That was John Ibbotson, writer-at-large for The Globe and Mail, bookended by Armin Yalnesian, the Atkinson Fellow on the Future of Workers, and Sean Spear from The Hub and The Monk School at U of T. Thanks. So. Thank you. Thank you. Tomorrow on the agenda. You should never have differences in the acceptance of fundamental, immutable public health principles purely based on the ideology of a particular region of the country. And we see that red states, which are predominantly Republican, have much less of a vaccination rate than blue states that are fundamentally democratic. That should not be when you're dealing with public health issues. That's tomorrow on the agenda. 50 years ago, certainly in polite company, sex was a taboo topic. Today, we live in a world where porn is available online 24 seven, and swipe left technology has transformed dating culture. A revolution, if you will. But according to Christine Amba's new book, it hasn't delivered better, just more. The book is called Rethinking Sex, A Provocation. Christine Amba is a columnist with the Washington Post, and she joins us now from the US Capitol. Hi, Christine. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for being on the show. So, um, you know, I think it's safe to assume that at no point in the past have so many women been as free to pursue their sexual pleasures as they do, say, in places like Washington or even here in Toronto. Um, yet, when I first started reading this book, I was kind of a little defensive. And you actually admit in the book towards the end uh, that, quote, uh, that this book was an uncomfortable book to write. If we're so free, why do we still get defensive or uncomfortable when talking about sex? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think you're totally right that we are, at least supposedly, at an era of kind of almost total sexual freedom, unlike anything our maybe our ancestors might have experienced. Um, you know, contraception is widespread. The social acceptance of extramarital sex is at an all-time high. There's less pressure um, to need to get married or even be in a relationship to be seen as an adult person. And sexual content is everywhere in media. So why exactly aren't we satisfied, is the question. You know, reports show that despite all of this supposed opportunity, uh, young people especially are having less sex than ever. And I think there are a couple of things that go into sort of this mismatch and also our discomfort, including my own discomfort, with talking about it sometimes. One of the big factors, I believe, is that, in fact, because of the accessibility of sex and the way that our culture has sort of um, connected the idea of sexual liberation to sort of personal liberation, it almost feels like we should be having more sex than we are, even if we don't necessarily want to be. You know, in many cases, feminism has been sort of misconstrued as just sexual liberation. I think a lot of young women feel that, well, to be an empowered modern woman, I 
should be out there, having as much sex as possible, having sex like the guys do. And to admit that that's not satisfying um, raises some questions of self-doubt. You know, is there something wrong with me that I'm not liking this as much as I've been told I should? Does it make me a bad feminist or a bad modern to admit that I want something different? And you, you kind of touch in the book about um, this chill culture where when you do meet people, no one really wants to feel or seem committed to uh, pursuing the other person. Um, so what is wrong with the ways that we are having sex nowadays that led you to want to rethink uh, about sex? Yeah, so, you know, I, <laughs> I didn't really go into this um, planning to write a book about sex. Um, but I'm a journalist and an opinion columnist at the Washington Post, and I spend a lot of time writing about ideas in society, ethics, you know, the way that we relate to each other. And in 2018, at the sort of peak of the Me Too moment, I was writing a lot about sort of those developments. And it seemed obvious to me at that point that the problems that we thought had gone away when it comes to sex hadn't, actually. And in fact, the rules were perhaps less clear now than they ever had been. You know, it was kind of hard for women in conversation to draw sort of a clear line. Um, while there were some obvious cases where we knew what had gone wrong, Harvey Weinstein, you cannot, in fact, drag starlets into your bedroom and sexually assault them, the cases that had the most discussion were the ones with gray areas, um, where mostly, you know, cis, straight women were ending up having sex that they didn't want to have, that they didn't enjoy, that left them feeling disappointed or even mildly traumatized afterwards. And unfortunately, consent, which we talk about a lot, was not enough to prevent this from happening. I hear so that. I, sorry, I hear that, and I kind of, um, I think maybe that's one of the things that was making me a bit defensive, because when we talk about consent, it feels incredible that we're at a time in history where we're talking about consent. Uh, when I grew up, there was no such thing. It was kind of like uh, we followed what you know, if we were in a heterosexual uh, relationship, what the guy wanted. Um, so why is consent not enough? Yeah, it feels like we should be almost past this. Um, and yes, consent is not enough. I mean, first of all, we have to acknowledge that consent is incredibly important. You know, and sort of as you said, we've come a long way in just being able to get to the place where we can say no means no. In fact, only yes means yes. We have to get consent before, you know, a sexual encounter for it to be at least legally acceptable. But legally acceptable is a really low bar. I think for most people, we want more from our sexual encounters than for them to be not criminal acts of sexual assault. Uh, we should hold ourselves to a higher standard. The question is, what should that standard be? And I would suggest that while consent is a great bar for determining what's, you know, not acceptable at all, we need to be asking ourselves more than, you know, what's legal and more about what is actually good. What does a good sexual encounter look like? And that would involve thinking about what is good for our partners and for society at large, not just ourselves in that moment. In the book, you say it's not its not just about the law, it should be more of an ethical um, question. You write that, uh, quote, consent is meant to separate criminal sex from non-criminal sex and sexual assault from everything else, but consent doesn't address the gravity of what sex is or how it affects us. Um, for some, uh, having sex is just a physical act, full stop. How can bad sex impact us to what you describe as, quote, the precise depths that sex reaches within us? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. When I would talk to um, both women and men for this book, one of the first questions I would ask in interviews is, okay, well, you know, what does sex mean to you? What do you want from sex? Uh, and most people would not, in fact, just say, oh, it's like a physical thing, I do it, I don't really care about it, it's pleasurable. They would talk about sort of intimacy, connection, you know, some sort of deep feeling. And when I would ask people what an ideal sexual encounter would be, um, whether you know they wanted to have sort of casual, meaningless sex, most people said, "No, not really. Like that's not my ideal." But would always follow up with, "Of course, you know, some people want that though, and we can't judge them." And I think that's fair. Um, but it was interesting to note that 
it was always someone else who was saying that. Very few, in fact, none of the people I spoke to said that that's what they wanted for themselves. And yet they sort of felt almost pressured to either act like they did or acknowledge it. Do you think that people are being coerced in a way in just having sex because we should be having sex because those are the expectations that everybody else has? You know, I do think that there is something about our social expectations that's pushing people to do things that maybe they aren't fully comfortable with or, you know, wouldn't necessarily choose for themselves. So you asked a bit earlier, and sorry, I kind of moved past this, about um, the idea of sort of this, this casualness, pretending not to care and not to want commitment. And in our modern society, there's a real emphasis on sort of the individual. We kind of reify the idea of our freedom um, and suggest that to each other, and you know, society's messages are around this, that freedom looks like not being connected to anyone else, not having to care about anyone else, you know, moving on as soon as possible, acquiring sexual experiences um, for the sake of the experience, you know, not necessarily the other person. And you see that in the shows we watch and in the books we read. You know, Sex in the City was uh, one of the texts, as it were, that so many people I interviewed cited. And, you know, it's a show about women sort of getting together and talking about the one-off sexual encounters that they had, making jokes and not caring about the other person. And because that message is sort of so pervasive, people feel like, well, you know, to be a modern feminist, what I'm hearing is I should do the same thing. Commitment is lame. <laughs> to be cool, I need to be chill and not have feelings. I want to come back to casual sex in a minute, but um, I want to talk about you for a second because you share yourself. You share some personal details in the book about yourself. Uh, your story begins with you being raised uh, by Nigerian uh, immigrant parents who were evangelical Christians. Uh, in time, you became a Catholic. Uh, to what extent is what you are reacting to and against is due to your upbringing? That is a great and kind of complicated question. Um, you know, one of the things that was interesting about writing this book, and I think that led me to write the book, was that I was, as I moved through sort of growing up with my parents in this tradition uh, and exploring sort of faith and spirituality and how I wanted to be an adult for myself, I personally felt pushed to reconsider a lot of my beliefs and my understandings of what sex looked like and what it should be, comparing sort of what I was told I should do to what I saw the people around me experiencing and what I felt when I had experiences. And in writing this book, you know, I was of course influenced by my, you know, religious faith and background, but I also wanted to sort of write and think about things in a way that would be accessible to anyone, whether secular or religious. And in some ways, I feel like I had an interesting and unique and kind of lucky vantage point in that because of my religious upbringing, I spent a long time sort of not totally involved in this scene, um, but being able to observe from sort of outside of the, you know, post-virginal circle, as I put it in my book, and then inside. And what I saw, what I saw my friends and loved ones experiencing, what I talked about with people, showed me that, you know, what was being promised by our sexual culture, what people thought and hoped they would get, was not always matching up with what they experienced. That's interesting when you said it, it's not, it wasn't matching because I remember when I was in my teens, there was kind of like this movement for within my friend circle, the first person to lose their virginity. And then the older you get, it becomes kind of like taboo to admit that you're a virgin. Uh, you lost your virginity in your 20s. Do you regret waiting? You know, I, I actually don't. Um, I think that waiting gave me a chance to, again, really think about what I wanted from sex and who I wanted to be as a person um, before sort of stumbling into things unaware. So I guess I had more almost mental and emotional preparatory time. Um, I do think, though, and I, I wrote about this in the book, there's a section that talks about this, there is sort of a, a stigma um, to waiting. And again, it comes with sort of these cultural ideas we have about um, tying sex to adulthood or tying sex to experience or, you know, 
being a feminist or a modern young person. In some ways, if you're not part of the sexual culture, however unsatisfying it may be, you can still feel like you're being left behind. Which is interesting because if we're free to do what we want to do, we should also be free to choose to not participate. Right, exactly. And I think that this is one of the promises that's sort of worth prodding at in the book, and that's kind of why I, I call it a provocation. Um, we are told sort of that sexual freedom, sexual liberation is great, and we should be able to go out and do whatever we want with anyone we want, sort of whenever we want to. Um, but that messaging almost seems to be that we should be doing that. Sex positivity has gone from, you know, be free to explore your sexuality to be out there exploring it all the time if you want to be a good feminist. And it doesn't really feel like freedom. If in the past, you know, sort of we were burdened by strictures of you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be having sex, you shouldn't be talking about it, for many young women especially, but also men, it now feels like there's pressure in the opposite direction. You should be doing this, you should be out there. And that's not really freedom either. Which, which leads us to this conversation around dating, because presumably before you have sex, you date. Um, we have some stats on how much harder dating has become over the last decade alone. Uh, nearly half of U.S. adults, 47 percent, said dating is harder today for most people compared with 10 years ago, while a third say it is about the same, and 19 percent say it's easier today. Women are much more likely than men to say dating has gotten harder at 55 percent versus 39 percent. Black women say 62% are more likely than Hispanic women at 50% to say dating has gotten harder, while 55% of white women say the same. Um, women find dating more difficult today than 10 years ago, which is kind of shocking to me because you're assuming that dating apps should offer women the opportunity to maybe vet men they're going to meet, uh, hopefully making it a safer and better experience. But why is it harder? You know, one of the first things I noticed in your relaying these statistics is the idea that, you know, presumably you date before you have sex, which is <laughs> <laughs> not always what happens these days. Um, but yeah, I think these statistics are exactly right. And, you know, you're giving them out also this year, this month, which is the 10th anniversary of Tinder, um, the dating app being launched and sort of launching a revolution in the way that we date and meet people. And I think that dating apps in general have really changed the culture um, of dating. If in the past you might meet someone through friends or, you know, your workplace or a church or some other association, uh, now you just sort of meet them through a swipeable act or a swipeable app. Meeting someone through your community means that there is usually at some level some accountability, you know. you have sort of some background on the person, that person knows that you know who they are and are connected to their peers. And so in some ways there's sort of a barrier, some accountability. People are less likely to act like their worst selves, uh, to send pictures of their genitals or ghost you if they know that it might get back to their community. But on dating apps, of course, there's not that level of accountability. You're sort of meeting in an enclosed and private space where anything could happen and nobody would know. And while that feels freeing, it can be really alienating at the same time. In what ways? Because I think before, um, when you'd go out on a date, it felt like if you're getting references from your friends, like that's a good guy. But when you're online, you don't really get to know these people that well. It just kind of like they present their best foot forward. Yeah, exactly. And then there's something about, you know, the way that dating apps are created and set up, um, most of these apps are sort of set up in this kind of card deck format, right, where you swipe through people um, left and right, and there's almost an, an ongoing chain of potential dates. And again, this seems really freeing. Like, now we have options. It's not just who you might run into at the corner store. But at the same time, that has changed the dating mindset for a lot of people, and both men and women feel this. It feels a bit more consumerist, right? Like you're shopping for a person. Uh, one woman I interviewed, you know, sort of bragged to me about how she ordered a guy off Tinder and then later said, you know, she realized that made it sound like she was ordering a 
pizza, and maybe that's not how she she should talk about a real person. Um, but because of this sort of sense of disposability, uh, often people don't treat the people they're on a date with as a full human being, and that can be really painful. Um, I, I, I'm glad that you used that word, painful, because um, that example you just used of use this person as an object instead of a person with feelings. Uh, you write uh, that casual sex, in particular, disadvantages women. Uh, what do you mean by that? Because I think some people might hear that and f maybe assume that you're being judgmental. Yeah, this is <laughs> this is one of the sections in the book um, that I also thought would be a provocation, and it turns out it was. Um, but I think that if we want to improve our sexual culture, make it better for all of us, we have to be honest about what sex really looks like. And, you know, I suggest that, especially if we're talking about heterosexual dating, um, men and women come to sort of the dating playing field with different vulnerabilities and, you know, different ways of being. Um, women can get pregnant, <laughs> generally, and, and men do not. And that's sort of a burden that women carry that men don't have to worry about. For women who are worried about or want to get married and start a family, uh, there is you know, a timeline that they have to be aware of that men don't have to focus on necessarily in the same way. And so in many cases, I do feel that, you know, Women sort of have to be aware of certain challenges. And then, of course, the basic thing that, in general, most women are, you know, smaller and weaker than men and are more susceptible to violence, especially, you know, sexual violence when it comes to dating. Um, there are vulnerabilities on, you know, women's side that we can't just paper over, right, and say, you know, well, everyone's dating is equals, you know, we should just treat everyone the same. To be fair, to be really just in how we think about sex, we have to think about the truth. Well, uh, the truth is that in the book you do talk about, um, you know, you, we talked about the pill. You talk about how some companies now are actually offering women one of the compensations is that you can freeze your eggs, and when it comes time for women to date and they have to go through the apps and. Sometimes the truth does hit them um, in a way that it goes beyond just a physical act. Um, are we able to have an honest co uh, conversation about how biologically we are different in these times? That's a hard question to answer. I mean, I think that this conversation is happening and is beginning to happen a little bit more openly. Um, but there are honestly justifiable reasons why it's it's kind of hard to talk about. You know, especially for feminists, I think that there is this idea, and it's not wrong, that it's already taken us so long to get to the point where, you know, women are seen as, in some sense, um, equivalent to men, are valued as much as men. And to start talking about how women have particular vulnerabilities or how, you know, women are different might actually set back the movement, might sort of set back that push for equality. But, you know, I think that it's really important to recognize that sameness um, is not necessarily, you know, you don't have to be the same to be respected and valued as equal human beings, you know, worthy of the same respect. In fact, by, you know, reaching people and talking to people as they are, male, female, non-binary, you're seeing them as a real person and treating them in the way that they need to be treated. And so having this conversation shouldn't be scary, shouldn't be seen as, you know, pushing women backwards, but actually appreciating the fullness of the female experience. We are two women speaking about this, and I wonder where men uh, fall in this discussion. You write, quote, the lies that men tell or have been told about themselves are harmful, too. Uh, what did you mean by that? Yeah, great question. I mean, I wrote this book mainly from the female perspective, you know, because starting, you know, in the Me Too moment, it was women who were having these experiences most often. But in talking to both men and women about sex, I realized, and you begin to realize, that these expectations, you know, hold true for men as well. There are so many men who feel like they can't actually say that they want a relationship, that they, you know, want caring or intimate sexual encounters. It's somehow unmasculine to say that. And so they're hiding, you know, a part of themselves. And that is painful for them. Men are part of the solution as much as, you know, women are. And we have to invite them to the table, too. 
Uh, you also, as part of this new sexual ethic, you also call for more sexual restraint. Does this apply to both sexes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one thing I talk about in the book is a better sexual ethic that might look something like willing the good of the other. Um, and what that means is, you know, not just getting consent, but thinking before going into a sexual encounter. Is this not just good for me, but also good for my partner? And to be able to understand what's good for your partner, you might have to know something about them. Uh, you might have to sort of wait and ask and see what they want. You also have to have taken the time to sort of think about what good sex really means for you and for them. And yes, all of these things take time. It's probably more likely that you would restrain yourself and not have sex with somebody else if you can't figure out what their good is. But I don't think that's a bad thing, necessarily. So you move uh, to just go to the very beginning of our conversation. It moves from consent, asking a question, to actually listening to what the other person has to say. Absolutely. Mutuality and sort of mutual respect, real care for the other human being and the other member of this encounter, whether it's for a night or for a whole relationship, is at heart what we should be doing in all of our encounters, not just sex. In our last 30 seconds, you also write something I just want to throw out there before we leave. Um, you write, the best sexual world is perhaps a less free one. What did you mean by that? Absolutely. You know, as we talked about in the beginning of this discussion, right, we have entered into a sort of totally liberated world, and yet so many people seem miserable. I think that actually one of the things that might benefit people is having higher standards, in some ways more rules and understandings for how we behave to each other and even to ourselves. Being able to go into an encounter with, you know, the expectation of safety, of care, would actually heighten the experience for a lot of people. Christine, congratulations. It is a terrific book. It really made me very uncomfortable, but I think that's how you learn in that moment. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And that is the agenda for Monday, September 19th, 2022. Tomorrow, a conversation with the public health official who's guided the last seven U.S. presidents, including during the COVID pandemic. And that's Dr. Anthony Fauci. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.